what I'm going to be talking about today is, is, is a bunch of model insights that we had um, associated with, uh, with putting the model together. Um, and so one of the um, uh, main value added of the model is that uh, we, we think carefully about how training decisions are affected um, when workers move between uh, jobs. Um, and in particular, that mobility can happen between employers directly. So what, what we're thinking about is, is we want to understand how workers are accumulating human capital during their careers. And the main behavior that we're interested in is, is employers uh, providing training. Whether or not that training cost is, is borne by the employer or borne by the worker, is, is the, our model specification is going to make that irrelevant. They, they, they can contract sufficiently well, that, that that's not an issue. Um, but the idea is that by working, you're actively acquiring uh, uh, human capital and, and there's a decision being made at, uh, in terms of, uh, of the speed of, of acquiring that human capital. It turns out that it's quite significant or quite important, um, at least in our setting, um, for, for efficiency uh, uh, reasons, whether or not you include uh, mobility directly between employers. Uh, the reason being that, at least in our view, when a worker moves between two employers, those two employers are meeting directly and non-frictionally in terms of competing for the worker. And so for wage determination purposes and, and for thinking about returns to, to human capital investments, that particular source of competition um, is important. And so just to sort of motivate, in the US, when we think about reallocation of workers, when a worker moves from one job to another, three quarters of, the, of that reallocation takes place without an unemployment spell in between. It is the, is the dominant source uh, of, of how workers move between, uh, between firms. Um, what you also find in data is that workers move in the direction of higher wages and, uh, uh, and seeking higher wages and more productive jobs. So all I want to say here is that I'm getting us set up for thinking about an economy where there is a hierarchy of firms and workers are moving up the hierarchy. That is the purpose. Of, of, of mobility, workers are, are trying to find, find uh, uh, more productive jobs. So what we're going to do in, 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 uh, in this paper is that we're going to think about the optimal design of employment contracts that are jointly determining wages and, um, and training. Uh, and uh, the contract that, 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 that we're thinking of is going to be isomorphic to a Postel de Nero 2002 type contract where uh, we have a notion of offer matching. That is, uh, if a worker meets an outside firm, these two firms are now going to engage in a competition over the worker and the worker will go to the firm that can offer the most at the price uh, that of, of, the, of the losing firm um, uh, going all out. That's not exactly how we envision the actual competition. I'm going to get into details as to a reinterpretation of that, uh, that, that I think is, is actually quite valuable. But that's the idea of Postal Dinero by 2002. So what I'm going to do is to provide some new insight into uh, efficiency of training. So this goes back to a literature that, that Asimoglu dominated for a while. Um, in, in, the late 90s, uh, in the late 90s, there's a bunch of papers and um, we're going to have some updates on this. Um, I'm going to talk specifically uh, also about the interaction between provision of training and frictions. And again, this was a topic that, that Daron dealt with. Then um, the implications of the model in terms of waste dynamics. And, and we're going to think about uh, training as being potentially both specific and general. So there's this is sort of the old style literature of thinking about training that we have two types of capital, um, uh, one completely specific and one completely general. And in a, you know, the, the, the firms are going to be 
providing both, and, and in a sense, we are kind of thinking about this as, as being a little bit of a, a convex, com uh, thinking about human capital ac uh, accumulation as, as being something of a convex combination of the two. Um, Do you get drop to job transition with wage decline? Yes, you can have that. I mean, and that's just, that's just a feature of, 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 of our contract being similar to Postel Vinen Robin. So, 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 so that's perfectly possible. But, but one I want to emphasize is that one of the results that we're getting is that uh, it, it, at least if you sort of take the um, uh, uh, common wisdom of, of, of how specific and general training uh, map through to, to, to wage dynamics, the idea is that uh, general training is immediately going to translate into, into if, if you increase your general training, the market, the labor market is going to, to, to bargain your wages up to your new productivity, um, whereas specific training has no particular uh, competition in the market, and so there's no real implications for, uh, for wages. That's not what's going to happen in this particular case. What's going to happen here is that wages are going to get bid up regardless of whether training is specific or general and there's going to be and that's going to happen both within jobs and between jobs um, and there's going to be an issue of how do you actually separately identify these two sources of training if all you have is is wage dynamics and and the obvious let me just now I'm deviating from my slides but the obvious um, source of literature that has dealt with that is Altonji and Shekatko and, and Topel that sort of thought about, well, we can make a distinction between experience effects on wages and tenure effects on wages as sort of a within and between job uh, wage growth. And the issue that we're dealing with is that when you actually go and write up a model like ours, you can't adopt a, an approach like that. And so we'll think a little bit. And so as, as we approach sort of this big micro uh, estimation that, that we have in mind, we, we have to deal with that problem in particular. Now, as for the relationship between frictions and training, uh, one of the nice insights of Asimoglu and Pishke was, hey, look, um, if you have a holdup problem, if, if your initial situation is characterized by an inefficiency due to a holdup problem, that is, um, I'd like to provide training to the worker, um, but as soon as I provide training to the worker, he goes and gets an outside offer, and now I have zero profits associated with zero exposed profits. So the only way that we can provide efficient training is if I can make the worker pay for the training fully up front. And if for some reason I can't make that happen, we have this holdup problem and, and, a, and an under provision of training. And so then the insight is, well, if you, if you have frictions, what, you, what, what, what effectively happens is that the, the human capital begins to take on features of, of specificity. That is, as I, provide, as I provide the worker with training, there is a distance between the worker and the rest of the market, and that means that at least for a period of time, I can potentially get away with paying the worker less than what the worker is, is uh, than the worker's marginal productivity, and that can, that can alleviate some of this holdup problem. And so the result was increased friction can actually increase training subject to this second best problem. Now the way that, that so, so we will confirm this insight and that's, that's going to be true now both for general and specific training. The, 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 the same holdup problem in our setting applies also to, the specific, uh, to, to specific training. Um, the way that we will deal with it is um, since I didn't want this contracting problem to uh, depend on notions of who's actually paying for the training because that struck me as so an unfortunate and uh, that's a relatively big failure of contracting that you can't even get past that issue. Um, so in, in our setup, the problem, the holdup problem um, associated with providing training comes from the facts, and this is related to what we've seen earlier today, comes from the fact that you cannot avoid that as you provide training, you, the, the worker is faced with an increase in consumption profile. Um, 
So you can potentially make the worker pay for the training up front, but the problem is the worker's consumption profile is now going to get steep, and we will uh, be adopting a, a utility function where that uh, um, intertemporal profile is is is, is um, uh, where the worker doesn't like uh, non-smooth uh, consumption profiles, and so you simply have a loss. Uh, in terms of optimal consumption profile design associated with providing training. Um, and then there's no borrowing and saving, I guess, is there? No, I'm going to shut that down. Um, would that undo that? Or? It wouldn't undo it, but it would modify it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get, I'll, maybe I'll get back to the issue. It, it's, it's, purely a, it's purely a modifier, and, um, and, and, and for a bunch of the other issues that you might think that it might work, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's not going to solve uh, the basic inefficiencies. Now, what we find, though, is that, fine, so as a partial equilibrium insight, this is a fine insight. But when you start thinking about the general equilibrium allocations that's associated with increasing frictions, we have, we have a few extra effects associated with um, uh, with allocation and training. Specifically, what we're going to find is that um, and I, one of the highlights that we're going to be, um, uh, uh, one of the things that we're going to be highlighting is that um, if you have a supermodular production function between worker human capital and, and the firm's productivity, more productive firms are going to be training more. And so it matters where you're allocated. Um, also, whether or not you're extracting more or less rents in your current relationship also matters for how much training you're going to be getting. And what, what frictions are going to be doing in both cases is that when you increase friction, you're going to increase mismatch. And that's going to reduce the amount of training that the worker is going to be given. Furthermore, the worker is also going to be getting a lower fraction of surplus in, in this model, and that's also going to be reducing training. And when you take that into account, what we're going to find is that when we, so to calibrate it to the US economy, an increase, increasing frictions from, from, from the calibration is going to result in less training, and, and significantly so. Um, this despite the fact that, uh, you know, we have these things going on, they just get dominated by the allocation implications. Um, it's a striking result of the model, and, and in particular of the, the wage determination mechanism, that when you have, um, when you shut down sort of this under provision issue, which is a result of assuming risk averse uh, uh, agents, so when we shut, risk aversion down, and when we think about um, uh, uh, the modular case, you get efficient training provision for any level of, of frictions. This is significant uh, because it is at least worth mentioning in, in that as Mogula 97 is sort of um, usually thought of as a sort of a standard argument that whenever you have frictions, you're going to get underinvestment. And the reason being that you don't fully take into account the gains that future employers have associated with the training that's being provi provided. Um, and that is true for certain wage determination mechanisms, but it's not true for our wage determination mechanism. It's not true in Moen and Usain uh, in, in their directed search model. Um, and really, this result, what, what this highlights is that, that as Mogla 97 is not truly about frictions per, per se, it's an interaction between a particular waste determination mechanism and frictions. And, and so um, that's at least worth keeping in mind. Yeah. Is the idea that you have the same feature that Foster and Amber about have that today I'm just going to offer you, I'm going to make you indifferent between what you're currently doing and in that way capture all of the surface from whatever we then do together. Yeah, so, so the point is that um, uh, take the case of, take the case, so, so this is for general training, right? So when I, when I make my worker uh, more productive by a certain amount, uh, that productivity, that, that worker becomes more productive with all firms by exactly that. So when two firms get into a fight with each other, 
that new firm ends up paying in a you know exactly um, uh, because both of us have gone up by the same amount, we end up that new firm ends up compensating the destruction of the of the old match by exactly that amount, and so there's not there's no gains to to future firms uh, from uh, associated with this uh, with this human capital. That is, the current match is fully compensated for the human capital investment, and so that's that's the basic idea. If you're doing like a, a wage bargaining kind of protocol, the new firm, the the the, the outside firm, uh, captures part of of of, of this gain, uh, and that's that's the problem. So it's called what I call the outside employer externality. I would like to understand a little bit the bigger picture of where this literature, so ha what proportion of firms are we talking about here in, let's say, in a country like in the US? So these type of models, because they, they must refer, first of all, to bigger firms, at least, so that training is even you know, affordable or desirable or manageable, and it must be certain industries as well. So could you just give me, an, or maybe the others, an idea of for what proportion of firms these type of models. So first of all, there is of course the notion of formal training, where you can go and see that you know resources were spent on this training, like like our um, money was paid for a course or something like that. Um, but I'm thinking about this a bit more broadly. I, I think you think about you designing a job that's you know there's there's a career path for this job. You can you, you, I'm going to have uh, people. I'm, I'm going to have management make sure that you that you're in a particular progression, that you're going to be exposed to particular kinds of tasks. That after a certain amount of time in this job, you could potentially be ready for middle management or or something like that. That's something that I suspect happens in a really broad. Uh, set of firms and, and how much effort you put into the design of that job is in a sense a training decision. So my, my, my long answer is if you think about training as being that, in, like that, that, that uh, abstract, I, I don't have a, an easy way of telling you, oh, it's this percentage of firms. It could be all firms. Some firms in my economy are going to provide very little training, but that's an active choice that they do because they're low quality. That wouldn't mean that they are not subject to this choice. So, so in, in summary, the empirical literature doesn't, that's using these type of models doesn't know, they can't say it doesn't really affect 60% of, of comedy of firms in a country or it just affects these industries or just firms with employers, employees more than 10. So this answer doesn't exist, so you don't know that from this literature. So there, there are literatures where you ask, you know, where you have survey evidence, did you, did you receive training or, or that sort of thing. But in a sense, if somebody said, I received zero training, I, I could potentially say, you know, this is just outside of the model. The, the, these firms are not part of this. Or it could be, well, that was an optimal choice to provide zero training, and that's within the model. Some firms will provide zero training. Um, I, I, I haven't come to the point where I've taken a stand on that. Uh, but in principle, this is about all firms. There is also a question of whether you think that, you know, uh, certain firms set their wages according to the contract that you will see. You know, but you know. All right. Um. So can I? I want to make sure I understand your, the point in general. Training is efficiently provided. That's not a statement that says a market with no frictions would have would that, that would still have more training potentially taking general training taking place. You're just saying, given the frictions in the market, we've got the efficient amount of training given those frictions um. or. Okay, because okay, I mean, so, so, if, if you might uh, be unemployed for a while, you're not getting the value. Yeah, 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 yeah right. Um, th the statement is, this is the training level for the for the given e e for the given economy that the social planner would okay. dictate for for this. Okay. Um, given the frictions. You know, given, given the frictions. Okay. Yes. Given that um, you lose your job once in a while and don't find them. Yeah, all of that stuff. Okay. Got it. Um, there is an interesting. I mean, I, I think. There's an th interesting theoretical insight that um, you 
you have a potential overinvestment in specific capital in low productivity firms. The reason being that that um, uh, you can use that 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 capital effectively becomes a, a bargaining chip when you meet a new firm, so you can extract rents from future firms using specific capital, and the uh, the existing firm can um, can distort the uh, uh, the um, the separation uh, or in, in 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 extracting rents from future employers. Uh, the existing match distorts the separation decision. What what can happen is that you decide to invest in specific capital. You understand if I meet if we meet a better firm in the future, that better firm has to compensate for the value of that specific capital. Um, but in reality, the planner would have loved for you to go to that better firm and get the specific capital there. But instead, you sort of get stuck at a lower level. Which is a nice feature, by the way, because it can kind of explain why people don't move up the ladder quite as much as, uh, as, we, as we would like to think in, say, recessions, or coming out of recessions. Okay. So one of the key things that, 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 that we thought were, were, were attractive was uh, the notion that more productive firms provide more training. That's going to give rise to a particular sorting channel. Something that Recent, uh, there's a recent article uh, or, or paper by, by Rob and Katka um, where they show a remarkable difference in degree of sorting in the economy depending on, on age of workers. That is, when workers are relatively young, uh, you have a, a moderate amount of sorting between worker types and firm types, but then for older workers, the sorting becomes really strong, something like on the order of like 0.7 or 0.8. This model is going to do something like that because when you've been in the market for a while, if you, if you get lucky enough to get into a good firm, you're going to end up with high levels of human capital. And, 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 and what, we're going to, what, what you're going to see is that, that more productive firms have, more, have, have higher human capital workers simply as a result of the endogenous investment in those workers, whereas low productivity, work, low, low productivity firms have less productive workers Again, the same kind of channel, and this gets stronger the longer uh, this has been going on, and and, and the model can uh, the model can can do that, and and really, this is this is one of the nice features about thinking about allocation and sorting in setups where types are no longer completely fixed, and that's that's one of the big steps that I think the sorting literature is beginning to tackle this notion that that people are changing. Um, Okay, a little, a little aside, which I think is, is kind of nice. We have this uh, discussion in the literature about, you know, what is it that's, that's determining waste dispersion? Is it simply that some people are more productive than others? So it's a human capital story. And the fact that somebody is paid a lot and somebody is paid a little, it's, it is what it is. It's just reflecting. It's not, there's no good luck, bad luck. It's, it's just productivity differences. And then there's the frictional point of view that, that there is a luck factor to this. What happens in this model is that you can be lucky that you get into a good firm, which subsequently makes you more productive. So you can get that, that if you narrowly look at what determines waste dispersion, you can find that that is primarily a human capital, determined by human capital. However, human capital variation can be driven by luck. And so, um, a little, a little philosophical aside. All right. Okay. So let's talk about the framework. So the framework is a standard random on the job search frame, uh, framework. Uh, I, I deal with, uh, with, uh, with the employment contracts a lot in, in my, um, in my paper about hidden search. Um, I, that aside, uh, but that's related in terms of contracting insights. Firms can provide training. Um, general and specific, uh, at intensity of their choice, um, and there's a cost associated with that. Um, what an employment contract does, and this is sort of this is really a mechanism design paper, is that it specifies um, compensation and training and continuation utilities conditional on employment history and conditional and outside offers. And, and the employment history has in it outside offers. Um, we're going to require that contracts be renegotiation proof. 
And the way that we're going to think about a contract responding to an outside offer is that it has set already in advance, it, it, it has set a response that, that says, if you come to me and you credibly tell me I have met this firm with this, with this particular productivity, in the contract, it states what your continuation utility is going to be. That, that is how the contract is designed. Then the outside firm can choose to respond to that or not. This is distinctly different from thinking about the firms engaging in Bertrand competition after the fact, where you sort of put them in a room and say, do your thing. That's not what's going on here. Um, this, is, this is a fully specified contract that the outside firm can respond to or not. Okay. So continuous time, firms and workers discounted rate row. Uh, you can either be employed or unemployed. When you're unemployed, you meet vacancies as a worker at rate lambda u. Sorry, that's still the contract. So when you mention offer, you really kind of have to compensate for the potential for specific skills and compensation that you would get like in the other firm. Right. Yes. So, so you understand, you know, the, the, the current firm in setting the, in designing the contract understands how valuable the worker is going to be with the outside employer. And the continuation utility is going to think about, you know, I have committed myself to a particular continuation utility. The outside firm gets to respond to that. If I, if, if it can beat me, it will. Otherwise, I will get to keep the worker. That's where you really are kind of compensating for firm-specific skills that you could have gotten in another firm. So firm-specific skills are inherently, you, you compensate them inherently, right? Because, because you're responding to, you know, I'm offering you an age earning profile. In my firm, I know you will develop firm-specific skills. And so your current employer knows that, and so it has to offer you something that would compensate for the loss of even firm-specific skills that you know in the firm that that makes you an offer. Is that right? Yes. So so there's an understanding that you have a productivity with me, and I have a willingness to pay for you that is potentially a function of specific human that human capital that is specific to me. If you go to somewhere else, I understand what part of how valuable you are to that firm, and, and including that that some of that specificity, specific human capital, the specific to me, may not translate. That may give me an advantage in terms of keeping you. Um, but it also uh, responds to the fact yeah. that you might get some firm but, specific but, human capital. But but, but in terms of the valuation, like how much the outside firm values you, includes the understanding that that outside firm can invest in in, in you. Yeah. So I should think about this contract as somehow like automating the the Patron competition. Yeah. So so in in a sense, it's it's a it's my little response to the Burdett critique, if you will, that why would two firms, why would the losing firm, a firm that knows that it's going to lose the Bertrand competition, why would it engage in Bertrand competition in the first place? Right. This, there is no Bertrand competition going on here. The existing firm has just said, if you meet this outside firm, this is how things are going to go. It's like you're preempting the offer, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then the outside firm gets to take a look at, at, at you know, your new contract and says, I can beat that or I can't. Okay, and in, in the case that they can't, in, in post and Robin, you still can use you can get them to be willing to pay up to the full value. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening here because the contract says, you know, the contract is committed to saying, uh, you get any offer from this phone type and I'll bump you. No, way. no, it's not even an offer. It's a statement that says, I know that you have met this firm type. I know that upon me changing the contract, you're going to take that contract to the outside firm and either you're going to move or you're going to stay. But I'm done, you know, I, you know. And so, and so effectively what happens is that you, of course, match the outside firm's willingness to pay, but, but you know, but it's, okay. it's, yeah. All right. So you meet firms depending on your current, uh, your current employment status, unemployed meeting rate, employed meeting rates. Uh, when you meet a firm or a vacancy, that vacancy is going to be characterized by a productivity that's going to be between zero and one and distributed according to a CDF, uh, phi. That's what we call the offer distribution. So 
just to keep things simple, and, and there's, this is just going to simplify notation, you can easily, and in fact that's what we've done, you can, uh, you can uh, generalize this to many different human capital levels. Uh, right now I'm just going to think about human capital like match specific, so specific human capital is being either high or low, and general human capital is being either high or low. What you're choosing is when you're choosing to, to invest intensively or less intensively, what you're choosing is the speed with which you switch. You're choosing a Poisson arrival of taking the worker from low to high. That's the idea. Um, there's a basic production technology that we're going to, that we're going to um, uh, represent by this production function that depends on the productivity of the firm and the human capital levels of the, of the worker. A worker is born unemployed and unskilled, you know, naked and, yes. Um, a worker dies at rate D, and the effective discount rate is going to be the death rate plus the, um, the discount rate. Um, wages, workers take per period utility of wages U of W, no savings or borrowings. Uh, we're going to think about the risk averse case, so U concave. Uh, weekly concave, I'm going to talk about, so the risk neutral case as well. Um, an unemployed worker receives uh, exactly the same thing as he or she would were she matched with the very worst firm and um, uh, with uh, low match specific human capital. So it's you're at the bottom uh, of of the of the ladder. That this is this is a little uh, a little significant in terms of thinking about the efficiency results. The point is that your general human capital is going to carry into unemployment. So you're going to be rewarded for for your general human capital re um, uh, achievements into unemployment. That is not the key part, because unemployment is short. So. I wouldn't be bothered by the fact that you would have two, two months of not fully realizing your, your general human capital gains. What this does is that coming out at the other end, you get to use it for bargaining purposes, and so it carries on the other side of unemployment as well, and that, that's a big deal in this model. Um, yeah, and, and because they're otherwise the on it. Otherwise, unemployment would become the channel through which you would have an on uh, you have an outside employer externality because coming out of unemployment, now your bargaining position would be dictated. Like if you just had an absolute level here, um, coming out on the other side of uh, unemployment, the outside employ the outside employers there could take advantage of your poor uh, poor uh, um, uh, bargaining position. Okay. The profit flow of a firm is simply, you know, the per period or uh, instantaneous profit flow of a firm is production minus wages minus general training cost minus match specific training cost. Ada is the Poisson arrival of taking the worker from low to high in general. Mu is the Poisson arrival rate of taking the worker from specific low to specific high. And these are convex, uh, increasing and convex cost functions. Matches are destroyed at exogenous rate delta, um, in which case the worker moves to unemployment. If the worker quits and moves to a better firm, or if the worker dies. Okay. So we are getting set up for thinking about the, the design problem here. So. First of all, the, the contract must satisfy two basic participation constraints, and the participation constraints are going to be the following. The worker can at any point costly quit to unemployment. Can I just ask you quickly, yeah. is P fix for the length of... Yep. Exactly. Um, the worker can at any point quit to unemployment, so the contract can never offer less than the value of unemployment to the worker. The firm can always lay off the worker should it want to, so the contract cannot specify negative uh, profits at any point. Um, the contract must be negotiation proof. That is, we can't Pareto improve on the contract in any states. Okay, 
So this is going to be the optimal contract design problem. This is following Spie and Srivastava, Thomas and Worrell, and, and Sanikov. Uh, and, and the basic idea is the following. So this is from the firm's point of view. The, the firm, uh, so, so we, we, this is using the insights that we can formulate this problem recursively. Uh, so what the firm is, is, is th this uh, pi here is the firm's profits associated with being itself, productivity P, having an HM worker and having promised the worker this minimum utility V. Um, subject to that, the contract is, is, uh, is, is, is dictating the following objects. The current wage, a growth rate in the utility promise to the worker, the, the two training rates, continuation utilities for the worker in case that the worker goes from low to high um, uh, general training and from low to high match specific training, and a, a, a continuation utility uh, function in response to an outside meeting. Yeah? Um, this has to be chosen from the set of feasible choices. And the profit to the firm is, well, instantaneous profits. And then at rate lambda e, the worker that the, that the firm is currently employing meets an outside firm. And so different things can happen. Um, but the way that, that the firm is going to think about it is, well, depending on the probability, uh, the, the productivity outside firm, I'm going to commit myself to a continuation offer. Given that continuation offer and given the, the, um, the type of the outside firm, the worker is going to stay with me with a certain probability. This is either going to be zero or one in the contract. Um, so, and given that the worker stays, we're now going to continue the contract subject to me having committed myself to a continuation utility promise of, of this. And the old match is dead. So this is the net gain of that. Yeah? Okay, so at rate eta, the worker moves from the current utility, the current uh, H to becoming high skill. This is the net value to the firm of that happening. And of course, if the worker is already high skill, this is zero value, so the firm would not train. Um, at rate mu, the worker moves from um, worker moves from current mass specific skill to to one, and this is the net value to the firm of that happening. And this is the rate at which the profit value to the firm changes over time, given the commitment to this growth rate in in the utility promise. So this is the full sort of setup of of the of the design problem. So what what is the firm going to do? Um, let me just make sure. Okay, so a key object in, in how to think about the contract design, so I have like 20 minutes. Yep. Um, a key object in how to think about the, the design, I think I already alluded to this, is to think about a firm's willingness to pay for, for a worker. That is, the, the highest utility level you're willing to give the worker and, and they still be willing to employ the worker. That is when you have zero profits associated with the worker. So this is when, when, when you would get into a second price auction, the willingness to pay for, for the worker is what you would bid. What you can show is that this willingness to pay is going to be increasing in P. That is, more productive firms are willing to pay more for their workers. That is not a shocking uh, um, statement. And from now on, as I reformulate this complicated looking object or, or, or problem, I'm going to stop thinking about firms in terms of, of their P's and, and, and that being their defining characteristic. And I'm going to start thinking about the firms as being really defined by their willingness to pay for the worker. That is ultimately what the worker is shopping for. The worker is shopping for willingnesses to pay. Yeah. And so the offer distribution, I'm going to reformulate instead of this phi, I'm going to start thinking about what is the, willing, what is the distribution of willingnesses to pay for a worker for a given general human capital level, right? Because by definition, a willingness to pay 
of a new firm always has has low match specific capital. When you go to a new firm, that that match specific capital is always zero. So, as a practical matter, all we care about is what is the firm's willingness to pay, conditional on on the worker's general skill. Now, what is your optimal? I think there's a sense in which what distinguishes firms is, is current productivity. Nothing about how learning opportunities or anything like that, or how quickly you learn. In, in that sense, they're not good at that learning or anything like that. No, and, and so, so you just have I mean, a high that, productivity today forever. Okay, and then um, you can you might make be more valuable to train the guy faster, but it's not that you're, they're better at it. Are you thinking about the question from the from from a worker heterogeneity perspective that some workers are going to be able to learn faster than others? Or are you thinking about firms as distinguishing themselves from others in terms of? Yeah, I guess I was just thinking whether some firms are kind of have particularly good learning opportunities relative to others. And, right. And um, they do in a sense that they're more productive firms are going to provide, I guess, optimally choose to train people, but they don't have an advantage in some sort of cost sense or anything right. like that. So you it's could imagine, different. you know, firms being different in terms of their cost right. functions, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, right now the assumption is that they don't. Uh, of course, if it's the case that more productive firms have a cost advantage also in terms of training, the basic results of more productive firms training workers more and so forth uh, are going to carry through. If you begin to somehow make the, your efficiency of training, I guess it's related to like foregone productivity or something, foregone output, and you're at a more productive firm, then you're foregoing more output for the. Yeah, in that yeah. case, in that case, you could modify. You could end up modifying things a bit. That's right. Um, so that's worthwhile thinking. Right now, it's it's a side that we've shut down. Okay. So what is the optimal choice of a firm in terms of how to respond to, to an outside meeting? Well, <clears throat> if um, so the, 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 the worker's optimal response, given, uh, given that the worker has been offered this continuation utility with the current firm and the worker is currently facing P prime is to say, okay, I'm going to stay with the firm if what the firm is currently offering beats the outside firm's willingness to pay. If the outside firm can beat my current firm's offer, I'm going to end up leaving. So that's what the firm is understanding, that as it sets omega, this is how the worker is going to respond. So the optimal response, as it turns out, not, not surprisingly, is to say, well, if I can beat the outside firm, if If the outside firm can beat me, then what I'm going to do, and, and this is important, that I'm going to go ahead and give an outside offer that, that I can in a, a credibly commit to. The reason why I'm doing this is, 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 is not trivial. This is part of delivering value to the worker. In my optimal contract design, I care about maximizing the value of the current contract. That includes allowing the worker to extract as much rent from a future employer as possible. So this is not some arbitrary choice. This is a choice of saying, I'm going to give you the best possible bargaining power when you do leave me. When you find that better, better uh, place to work, by all means go and I'm going to give you the best possible, best possible bargaining position there. So this is, this is a through dominant choice. I can pay less through, uh, throughout the period. That exactly, because then I can, by committing to that, I can extract rents from the relationship through, through a lower wage now, right? If, if it is the case that I can beat the outside firm, but the outside firm can beat the worker's current uh, contracts, I match the outside firm. If the outside firm can't even beat the current contract, we go on as is. Um, and that's just for smoothing purposes. Okay? All right. This ends up looking exactly like uh, Pustel Venere, Robot 2002, but just keep in mind, it is not exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, all right. 
So with all of this, it turns out that you can rewrite the, uh, the, des uh, the design problem a, a lot simpler. In particular, think about it from, from the worker's point of view. From the, work the worker's valuation of a particular contract um, uh, can be written recursively the following way. Um, the worker takes utility from current wage. At rate eta, the worker becomes high skilled and gets this utility uh, promise from the contract. At rate mu, uh, it becomes high match specific skills and gets m. At rate delta, gets sent into unemployment. And this is the rate at which the utility promise is changing over time. And this is the net value of getting an outside offer. And getting an out, the value of getting an outside offer is just going to be, well, if I meet an outside firm, that is between my current firm's willingness to pay and what I'm currently getting, I'm going to get the, a net improvement of moving to, to that outside firm's willingness to pay. If I meet an outside firm that can beat my current firm, I'm going to be going to that outside firm and get a utility promise equal to my current firm's willingness to pay, which is, and the net value of that is this. Okay, so that turns out that you can write that fairly simply in this particular uh, case. An unemployed worker, all you have to do to hire an unemployed worker is to offer the value of unemployment to the worker. And so when you're unemployed, uh, the value of unemployment is just an infinite discounted stream of, of being unemployed. It's not that you are unemployed forever, it's that you don't care about you know, getting that offer of employment. Yeah. So you could very easily generalize this to the case when workers that are trained and pushed into the high skill level um, have to pay a penalty if they leave. Within a a, certain a penalty time. what? If they leave. If they leave. Because that exists, right? Employers do use this so that, say, for instance, if they give scholarships to go to university, they're forced to stay these for another two or three years so that they come back. So you, you could generalize your model for this. Yeah, for those kinds of side payments. By adding costs to this, right? Because this is, these are things that are put into the contract. Sure. So, so that, but that would be a design choice that you would put on top of, you know, if if you decide to leave, I'm going to have a side payment uh, as as part of the contract. That could be done. And have you done that? And would that? I, I don't think it would change anything, right? Because it would just be an extra, like a constant, that's added. Is that right? In the cost? It's not going to change anything in this contract because all that side payment is is an internal transfer between these two and you don't want to fiddle with the efficient separation. You're, so, so right now it is efficient that you go to a more productive future employer. Uh, it, it is privately efficient that, that that happens and that they go ex and extract rents from. Uh, right now, when, when, when you go to a future employer, that future employer always ends up perfectly compensating the current match for being destroyed. That is, that is, um, that is what this is. When, 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 um, when the outside employer goes and, 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 and takes your future employer, in doing so, the future employer pays the total value of the existing match. And so there is no loss to, there is no loss to the current match of being destroyed. And so the, a lot of the notions of, of, of these kinds of penalties and so forth are, are, are attempts at protecting the match from destruction. They don't care about, they're, they're being fully compensated for, for that. For the individual, but you know, if, you, if, you thought, if a firm came to you and asked you, Rasmus, would it make sense for us to introduce these into the contracts? If we train our highest um, employees, like highest school employees, would it make sense to put in a two-year clause um, would that, you know, throw some sand into into these dynamics to sh put some frictions in there? Would that make sense? So could you could you answer that question from this type of analysis? They would not. They would not need this um, because right now it, they are separating efficiently privately. If, yeah. Privately, they are in full agreement over. At what, at, what, at what point is the outside firm such 
that you should leave. There is no, there's no internal disagreement and, and the training decision is not being adversely affected by, by these events. But why do firms do this then in reality in the real world? Maybe because they're constrained in terms of what instruments they have available in, relative to this particular contract. Um, I'm not going to get into too much additional detail, but yes, that's a good question. Um, should be said that there is one particular case where, and you guys um, were very kind, this firm would love to be able to somehow commit itself to promise more than its own willingness to pay. And so potentially what you would like to do is to engage with a third outside party to allow yourself that commitment. You cannot internally commit yourself, I mean, because these kinds of side payments, you could kind of think that if the firm was somehow committed to paying the worker something upon leaving, it would actually be willing to pay more to keep the worker. The problem is that that side payment can be undone with another side payment. But if you somehow committed yourself to a third party that the firm has to pay something to a third party if the worker leaves or something, then this willingness to pay goes up. And what you're doing is that you're allowing yourself additional rent extraction with future employers. And that's where there is a finesse here in, in potentially doing these side payments. I don't know if this is how you want to understand, you know, soccer clubs or, or something. I don't know. But yeah, I'm, I'm sort of short on time, so... Um, okay, eight minutes. All right, so bottom line. You can simplify this design problem considerably using the insights we've done. Uh, it becomes a, a problem of, you know, where we've built in the optimal choice of omegas and so forth. And, and, and all you're really choosing is, is our wages, uh, growth rate in V, training rates and continuation utilities, subject to delivering a particular utility promise to the worker, which is dictated by the feasible, by, the, by, by this, um, set of feasible choices of, of contracts and participation constraints. This is, this look, I don't know if it looks complicated, but um, this is not a difficult problem to solve on a computer. Um, okay, so what are the insights? There is no moral hazard or anything in this problem, so it shouldn't be shocking that um, we're going to be implementing a flat, uh, a flat uh, um, contract. The only, the only time wages are going to go, uh, go up is uh, when, when you're faced with outside competition and that comes as a result of this sort of uh, limited commitment that, that, is, uh, that is in the contract, uh, by the way that you have to respond to outside offers. Um, wages are going to be strictly increasing in V, and since you respond to outside offers by increasing V, that's why wages go up. Kind of interestingly, and maybe not surprisingly, wages are going to be flat across human capital jumps. This is uh, notable in the sense that a, a lot of uh, shortcuts in the literature assumes that wages are just proportional to human capital. That's not what's going to happen here. But what is going to happen is that when you do become more, more productive, um, when you get outside offers, those outside offers now have additional um, potential for, for, for giving uh, wage increases, and that's how your wages go up, ultimately. Um, gains from training are going to be strictly shared. Um, it, it, that's true for both general human capital and specific human capital. And just to sort of, you know, in a sense, if you were to think about sort of beggar intuitions, the, the way that you would think about a perfectly competitive market would be to say, well, for general training, gains go completely to the worker. As soon as you become uh, more skilled, you end up getting the willingness to pay of the firm uh, for, for that general skill. And when it comes to match specific human capital, the, 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 work, the firm doesn't have to do anything and just keeps you at your current utility promise. What, what, is this, or what is interesting in this case is that the continuation utility promises lies in between those um, uh, uh, bounds. Okay, um, hold up problem restricts training. That is, um, your training choices are going to be increasing in V uh, in, in both cases. I'll get back to that. More productive firms on average provide more training. All right, so 
in the interest of time, I'm going to move relative. I want to, so this is, this is the case of thinking about willingness is to pay in response to a worker becoming generally skilled versus specifically skilled. And this, the specific case I'd like to emphasize a little bit. What happens to an outside firm's willingness to, to, to pay for a worker uh, that has become specifically skilled is that when, when, when I have become, uh, so, so think about a firm that is currently employing a worker and this is the most that that firm is willing to pay for the worker. Now, and, and, and let's say that the, that the worker is, is, is with uh, productivity P. Now the worker becomes specifically skilled with that firm. What happens is that it used to be that if the worker met any firm above P, the worker would leave. But now there's going to be a range at which a more productive firm actually can't beat the existing firm because the existing firm has this match specific high level of human capital. But what does happen when the worker meets such a firm is that that outside firm now makes the worker's wage go up. So outside competitive pressure drives wages up even though this is perfectly match specific skill, but it's the presence of these more productive firms in the market that can put pressure on wages even though that, that capital is completely specific to the current firm. And that's why you have within wage growth as a result of completely specific human capital uh, growth. It also means that specific human capital uh, makes um, a mobility decline. And that is the key insight into thinking about how you identify match specific human capital. It has mobility implications. But from the wage point of view, it looks very similar to general human capital in that wages go up both uh, within and of course the increased human capital also means that when you do move, you move to better firms and you move with better bargaining positions. Okay. All right. So uh, let me um, let me move on to we sh we show a, a full efficiency analysis for the risk neutral case and and establish what I talked about in the inter in in the introduction. Let me talk about uh, the calibrated model. And, the, and, and, and its implications for, for how friction and training uh, behave. So in two minutes. Okay, so um, power, so, so uh, constant absolute risk aversion, um, power cost functions, a modular production function. So there's no particular reason for why you would get uh, increasing uh, training in, in productivity just as a result of, of this. It, it comes through other channels. Okay, we match to these moments, they're completely standard moments. This means nothing to you. Um, yes, it, not, not in as short time as this, we, we fit fine. Okay, all right, so, so what does a contract look like in, in, uh, in, in this economy? This is, these are training rates by different kinds of firms, uh, depending on the, the worker's current state of human capital. So first of all, what you see is that training is going to be increasing in the, uh, in the productivity of the firm, and you're going to have that, uh, there's a basic complementarity between uh, the human capital of, 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 of the worker. So this is, this is general training, so this is uh, for, for um, the dotted line is for M equal to one, that is a high match specific human capital worker is going to get more training in terms of general specificity because um, th there turns out to be a, a basic complementarity between, uh, between human capital levels. Um, uh, in this case, uh, you also broadly speaking have increasing training levels in, um, uh, in, uh, um, in, general, in, in match specific human capital. In, in the economy, what you have is um, more, more productive firms are going to, on average, provide more uh, training to, uh, to workers. The reason why we're taking an expectation is that different firms, uh, the same firm is going to provide potentially different levels of training depending on how generous the contract is. So what this, what this contract is really, the fact that, that it is a function is that it's a function of the worker's uh, utility promise. 
Um, on average, though, the utility promises are such an average that you provide more training. Okay, so now I'm going to make this argument that um, when I increase friction, first of all, in a partial sense, I have that as um, uh, as increase as I increase friction, I increase training the Asimoglu and Pishka type of argument. But then I'm also going to show that as I increase friction, I'm going to worsen the allocation, and as a result of the worsening of the allocation and the worsening of bargaining positions, training is actually going to go down, and I'm going to decompose that. So, think about a firm type, in this particular case, the 90th percentile firm, and think about there being two friction levels represented by the rate at which an employed worker meets an outside firm. This is the high friction case, this is the low friction case. So this is a case where you meet outside firms faster. So what you find is that as you go, the solid line is for the, uh, the low friction case. As we, as we drop frictions, um, firms provide less training. This is exactly the Asimoglu and Pischke point. And it's exactly for the same reasons now, when you provide training, consumption profiles become steeper, that's less attractive, you hold back on training. The same thing happens for match specific training. Now, what also happens is that as you, as you reduce frictions, workers begin to extract additional rents and matches. That in itself begins to offset this, this effect that that you give less training everywhere. So what I'm showing here is that this is the average training level provided in different kinds of, of firms. And already here you begin to see that more productive firms are actually providing more training just because contracts begin to get more generous. Now, in addition, you're also going to have that workers tend to be better placed when, they, when, they are, when there is less friction. And overall, when you go and look at how much training is on average being provided, and as, as a result, what is the average human capital level in the economy as a function of the, of the level of friction? As I take friction down, that is, you know, the arrival rate is going up, I, I see a distinct increase in the, human cap, in the general human capital in the economy. It's, it's, less, it's less pronounced, or it's non-monotone, in match specific, and that's because you have more job destruction as well, right? So there's there's additional match specific human capital uh, destruction. All right, sorting. Last point. Lots of sorting. This is the average level of human capital conditioned on the type of the firm, and this is there was no there's no assortative matching in this model. There isn't anything that says. I'm only going to hire a high productivity guy or anything like that. And, it, and at the outset, all firms were the, all workers were exactly the same. Nevertheless, when I go in and I look at a high productivity firm, that firm has much more productive workers than a low productivity firm. Same thing with match specific capital. All right. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> we should probably end there. And, uh, thank you. Thank you.